Income tax 2023-2024, itemized deductions, charity gifts by cash or check, and other than by cash or check. Get ready and some coffee because we need extreme concentration when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in the instructions for Schedule A Tax Year 2023, which you could find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on what I would call the below-the-line deductions, more specifically the itemized deductions. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income noting deductions for taxes are good therefore we'll typically look for more of them and the difference between the above the line deductions first a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Adjustments to income and the below-the-line deductions include that the above-the-line deductions do not need to clear a hurdle such as the standard deduction in order for them to be useful, whereas the itemized deductions typically do need to clear the hurdle of the standard deduction before they are useful to the taxpayer. First page of the Form 1040 focused on line number 12, standard deduction or itemized deduction, taking the larger of the two. If we are itemizing, then we'll have the Schedule A. Schedule A is the itemized deductions. We see a list of some of the categories on the left, although this is not the entire schedule. Noting that the itemized deductions have to clear the standard deduction, standard deduction based primarily on filing status. So we'd want to memorize the hurdles to clear single filer 13850, married filing joint double to 27700, head of household in the middle 20,800. If they're over a certain age and or blind, we have an increase of those standard deductions. Here's for a single filer if one or two of those combo married filing joint where we have four combos that could be met to taxpayers two items and there's the related standard deductions okay let's move on to the charitable uh, contributions noting and recalling to keep straight in our mind the normal or natural types of deductions for an income tax versus deductions that are kind of unusual for it a normal kind of deduction for income taxes would be those expenses that you need to expend in order to generate the revenue, which can clearly be seen most easily on something like business income that often is reported on a Schedule C where you have income minus the expenses you needed to generate the income. That makes sense from an income tax perspective because you don't want to tax people on their gross income, but on their net income. However, most people have W-2 income, in which case we're assuming that the expenses were provided by the employer. Remember that the itemized deductions, what we're talking about now, are usually not natural to an income tax system. They're not things that are used to help to just generate revenue so the government can stay out of our business and just protect us with the military, but rather they're designed to nudge us in particular directions, which clearly is what is happening with charitable deductions. They're, the argument would be that they're trying to incentivize charitable contributions. A cynic might say that they're trying to tell us which contributions or which charities are worthy of our donations uh, and direct the money where they want it to go kind of thing. But, but that's the idea. So we have to then think about those charitable contributions in 
alignment with the Schedule A deductions. So gifts by cash or check. So enter on line 11 the total value of gifts you made in cash or check, including out-of-pocket expenses unless a limit on deduction gifts applies to you. So we talked a little bit about some of the limits in a prior presentation, remembering that if you're looking at lower income taxpayers, the problem is they might not be able to get a benefit from giving to charity because they're not itemizing. Higher income taxpayers usually are not going to hit the limit of in terms of how much they can put into a charitable contribution because it's fairly high, but it's possible that they put more money in than they're allowed to put in given the limitations, which will be based on their income or more specifically, typically their adjusted gross income, which will be helpful to determine using tax software typically. So for uh, more information about the limits on de deducting gifts, see limit on the amount you can deduct, which we looked at earlier. If your deduction is limited, you may have a carryover to next year. So again, the limitation not quite common, but could happen for higher income individuals depending on what they are doing. Then the question is, do you lose the deduction entirely or do we get to carry it back or carry it forward? Typically with the charitable contributions, you might be able to carry it forward. For more information on that, you can see publication 526 for more information. So deduction for gifts by cash or check limited. If your deduction for gifts you made in cash or, or by check is limited, see publication 526 to figure the amount you can deduct. Only enter on line 11 the deductible value of gifts you made in cash or by check on the actual Schedule A. Record keeping. For any contribution made uh, in cash, regardless of the amount, you must maintain as a record of the contribution a bank record such as a canceled check or credit card statement or a written record from the charity. Now, when we think about the audit trail, the audit trail is really important if we have a legitimate type of deduction. Notice there's multiple kind of concerns with different kinds of payments and how much intervention the government has in individuals' businesses, meaning usually Americans might not like the government tracking all of the things that they are paying for and whatnot. And cash is typically king in that you can spend cash on things and you don't have that kind of audit trail that you typically do have when you have like a credit card transactions or electronic transactions. However, if you have a deductible item, if it was like a business expense, or if it was something that you expect to deduct on the Schedule A, you of course want the audit trail, not because you have to report it, at least not at this time, when you do your taxes on the tax return on the 1040, but in the event of an audit, then they're going to want to see that kind of audit trail. You can't just say, well, I, I, I paid it out. I got some money out of the ATM and then I paid it to somebody or I took the money out of from underneath my mattress and then I just kind of paid it. No, you want to have the audit trail so that you can verify uh, the payment. So the written record must include the name of the charity date and amount of the contribution. If you made contributions through payroll deduction, see publication 526 for information on records you must keep. Don't attach the record to your tax return. Instead, keep it with your other tax records. So this is one of those items where the IRS does not have like a 1099 or a 1098 telling them how much money you gave to charity. It's something that you still have the, the capacity to voluntarily report, which is supposed to be our whole tax system, a voluntarily reporting system where they verify with audits in a similar way as if you're driving on the freeway, there's a speed limit. You're not going to get caught all the time if you're speeding, but sometimes the, the officer might, you, you might get caught sometimes, right? And the way to apply that same kind of philosophy on taxes is to have some format of random audits, right? So they can check people and see if they're in compliance. And if not, have the penalties high enough that it will dissuade you from cheating basically in the future. So for contributions of $250 or more, you must also have a contemporaneous written acknowledgement from the charitable organization. So if you're going over that $250, $250 limitation, you all also want the documentation from uh, the charity, not just basically your 
uh, your written records and hopefully an electronic transfer or a canceled check or something like that. Most charitable organizations will flaunt the fact that they're charitable organizations because that's how they make money. And hopefully they will be good at reporting to you any gifts over the 250. So you can see gifts of 250 or more earlier for more information, which we discussed. You will still need to keep a record of when you made the cash contribution if the contemporary written acknowledgement doesn't include that information. Line number 12, other than by cash or check. So enter on line 12, the total value of your contribution of property other than by cash or check, unless a limit on deducting gifts applies to you. So for more information about the limits on deducting gifts, you can see those same limits on the amount that we looked at earlier. If your deduction is limited, you may have, have a carry over to next year, similar kind of process we discussed. Deduction for gifts other than by cash or uh, check limited. So if your deduction for the contribution of property other than by cash or check is limited, you can see publication 526 to figure the amount that you can deduct. Tax software is, of course, helpful in that situation. Valuing contributions of used items. So now we've got the, the, the situation, which is often kind of problematic or a headache to tax preparers. You gave something to charity that was a used item. Well, that's going to be a little bit more difficult to deal with than just giving a cash value to the charity because when you give cash to the charity or a check to the charity or an electronic transfer, we know how much was given. But if something was given that was a used item, it still, of course, has some value or else the charitable organization theoretically wouldn't want it. But what is that value? So if you give used items such as clothing, furniture, deduct the fair market value at the time you gave them. So then the question is, well, how in the world am I going to know what the fair market value is? Because the fair market value is determined by trading things, selling things on the fair market. And if you have used clothes, then it's like you would have to find a buyer that would want the used clothes, first of all. And then what would be the fair value of that kind of transaction. Difficult to say, which is probably why you're giving it away. So it's a theoretical concept that works well for us, the fair market value, but in practice, difficult to determine. So fair market value is what a willing buyer would pay a willing seller when neither has to buy or sell and both are aware of the contributions of the sale. So for more details on determining the value of donated property, if you wanna dive into that, in more detail, publication 561, 561. So uh, deduction more than $500. So if the amount of your deduction is more than $500, you must complete and attach form 8283. So now you need more detail because you're over the dollar limit when you're giving clothes and whatnot. So for this purpose, the quote amount of your deduction end quote means your de uh, deduction before applying any in income limits that could result in a carryover of contributions. So contribution of motor vehicle, boat or airplane. So now we've leveled up from giving like clothes and things like that to giving some type of vehicle, a boat or an airplane, which of course the dollar amount you would think would go up. You have the same problem in that although you can kind of look at the Kelly Blue Book of a vehicle or a boat or something like that or an airplane, they are all unique in that you have different wear and tear and maintenance that has been kept on those. Therefore, determining the fair market value is difficult. So if you deduct more than $500 for a contribution of a motor vehicle, boat, or airplane, you must also attach a statement from the charitable organization to your paper return. The organization must use form 1098C to provide the required information. If your total deduction is over $5,000, 500 for certain contributions of clothing and household items discussed next, you may also have to get uh, appraisals of the values of the donated property. So clearly when you're looking at high dollar amount items, now you have charitable deductions, you've allowed charitable deductions to happen. And now what are people going to try to do if you were trying to game the system? They're going to try to give a, a lemon of a car, a piece of garbage car, and then overvalue it, right? Because then you get a large deduction. So there are many scams 
that are set up, you know, from a tax planning, you know, people doing kind of shady things on the tax preparation side with regards to charity contributions, because when you get into this valuation of the thing that is being given, it's easy to then try to say, well, I overvalued it. Well, how do we stop people from overvaluing something like a car or a boat or an airplane? We can force them to take an appraisal, which is basically, it's kind of like a home appraisal. Someone's going to come in, hopefully a third party will come in and give an accurate valuation of the property. Even that is going to make it difficult because that means like the third party appraisal person could also be leaning towards the high end of the appraisal because they know where their bread is buttered. They're trying to, the, the person who wants the appraisal wants the value to be high because they're trying to get a deduction. And so that's where the issues come in. So you could see form A2, A3 and its, con and its instructions for details if that applies to you. Contributions of clothing, household items. A deduction for these contributions will be allowed only if the items are in good used condition or better. So again, what does that even mean? It's, it's nice wordage in theory, but that's hard to know in practice. So however, I, I, my, my, my clothes are good, usable, even with holes like all, you know, all over them, right? It's still, still good. It's still good. It's like Al Bundy's socks, right? I don't know. <laughs> however, this rule doesn't apply to a contribution of any single item for which a deduction of more than $500 is claimed and for which you include a qualified appraisal and uh, form 8283 uh, with your tax return. Record keeping. If you gave property, you should keep a receipt or written statement from the organization you gave the property to or a reliable written record that shows the organization's name and address, the date and location of the gift, and a description of the property. This is going to be important for us because typically you might have to have that information in order to in enter into the actual tax uh, return. Now note what the organization cannot give you. They can't give you the actual amount, meaning if you gave them clothes or something like that, they're not going to know the value of the clothes. They're not going to want to take on that liability to try to value the clothes. They're not a pawn shop. They're, they're going to instead give you the information saying, hey, this is what was given to us. This is the date that it was given. Here's our address and so on. And, and that's what we're going to have when we're trying to enter this into the tax return, hopefully. So for each gift of property, you should also keep reliable written records that include uh, how you figure the property's value at the time you gave it. So if you get audited, this is good, what they're going to ask you. Well, give us evidence that property was given and then give us some kind of explanation as to how you came up with the value that you put on the tax return. So if the value was determined by an appraisal, keep a signed copy of the appraisal. So if it was a high dollar amount item, then you might have got the third party appraisal, which gives you more solid support. If it's, a, if it's a lower dollar item and you don't need the appraisal, you might not have the appraisal and you did the best you could uh, with what you had. So the cost or other basis of the property, if you uh, must reduce it by any ordinary income or capital gain that would have resulted if the property had been sold at its fair market value, uh, how you figured your deduction if you choose to reduce your deduction for gifts of capital gain property, any, con any conditions attached to the gift. So if the gift of property is $250 or more, you must also have a contemporaneous written acknowledgement from the charity. See gifts of $250 or more earlier for more information. You have form 8283 doesn't satisfy the contemporary as written acknowledgement requirement and a contemporary as written acknowledgement isn't a substitute for the other records you may need to keep if you gave property. Line 13, we have the carryover from the prior year. So we saw that there were possibly limitations on how much you can give to the charity on the higher income side. If you're on the low income side, you're probably not going to get any benefit. Uh, any tax benefit because you're not going to be itemizing higher income side you could be limited if in one year a lot of money was given to charity and it was over the agi limitations in which case 
you might be able to carry over to the following year. So if that happened in 2022, you gave more than you were allowed to give, then you might have a carryover from 2022 to 2023. Noting that if you're using tax software, if you're a tax preparer and you have itemized deductions, you have a more complex return, I would recommend if you have a new client, for example, entering the entire prior year tax return in the prior year software so that when you roll it over to the current year, the software will help you with these carryovers so you make sure that you don't miss them. So you may have contributions that you, you couldn't deduct in an earlier year because they exceeded the limits on the amount you could deduct. In most cases, you have five years to use contributions that were limited in an earlier year. Generally, the same limits apply this year to your carryover amounts uh, as applied to those amounts in the earlier year. So in other words, if you were limited to the amount of the contribution that you can take last year, you gave more than you can take, you might be able to give it this year. If you then had more that you can give this year, the same limits would apply, you would think, right? Same idea, and then it would roll forward to the following year. However, uh, carryover amounts from contributions made in 2020 or 2021 are subject to 60% limitation if you deduct those amounts in 2023. So they kind of messed with the limitation thresholds in a few years, which obviously complicates things a bit uh, when you're trying to do your carryovers and so on. After applying those limits, enter the amount of your carryover that are allowed to deduct this year. See publication 526 for more details. Now, obviously, software, again, helpful with that.